Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on the book, Amazing Friendships Between Animals and Saints. I wanna thank you for uh, being with us today. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, we have all kinds of friends from across the country. It's more than uh, 300 people, or close to 300 people registered today. My name is Joe Sinosak. I'm the publishing director for Novalis Publishing and we've organized this webinar this afternoon. And we have a, a great afternoon uh, prepared with uh, the author of this book, Greg Kennedy, and Carrie Lynn Wilson, who's the illustrator and also author of the many online resources we have for this book and uh, that we'll be talking about today. Uh, just want to show you so you can see it. If you haven't seen a copy for yourself, this is the actual book, Amazing Friendships. Uh, and later, you'll get a chance to tour some of the really beautiful illustrations in the book uh, that Carrie's done, and she's going to walk you through them and, and uh, a little bit about some of her methods. But before we get there, I do have a few uh, comments I want to make about why we're doing this and a little bit about how this webinar will be unfolding this afternoon. To start with, I just want to say that we organized this webinar because we realized that with a book like this, it isn't enough really to simply launch it into the world, the bookstores, or, uh, or you know, during this pandemic of uh, online book distributors and expect uh, that that's the end of it. This is not just a children's book of uh, nice stories and beautiful illustrations, though of course it is that, but it's also a unique way to explore the relationship uh, between God and creation through the use of story and art. It has something really to teach all of us, uh, not just children. So Carrie and Greg have really gone beyond and above the uh, call of duty here to create numerous free downloadable resources uh, that can help teachers and parents to delve more deeply into their spirituality and their understanding of the natural world. And so we wanted to have a chance to talk about some of those with you today. And finally, we want to take the opportunity to highlight some of the aspects of this book and for Carrie and Greg to have a chance to share their joy in its creation. I do want to mention that the, if you don't have a copy of your own book and you would like to get one, that at the end of this uh, webinar, there will be a panel there. It'll have a code and a website. And if you take down that code and it's the Novalis website, you can get 20% off uh, the purchase of the book. So uh, make sure you uh, catch that at the end. I will mention it again. So there we are. Right now, I would like to do a little bit of introductions. Uh, many of you probably know Greg and Carrie already. Uh, I know that a lot of our, our friends are gathered here with us this afternoon. Um, but I will say a few words just about each. So Greg is a Jesuit priest working in spirituality and ecology at the Ignatius Jesuit Center in Guelph, Ontario. And uh, his other books include Reupholstered Psalms, Ancient Songs Sung New, also published by Novalis. Carrie Lynn Wilson is the illustrator and author of the many extra resources uh, for this book that are on our website. Uh, she also lives in Guelph, is a mother, an artist, spiritual director, and a music teacher who really treasures her whimsical collection of picture books. This, uh, her first book was drawn as a spiritual practice. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Greg. Thank you, Joe. And thank you all of you for coming on this beautiful sunny day. I hope it is as beautiful where you are as where I am and Carrie is, well, Carrie is in a different home. But I am at, we are both in Guelph, Ontario, which is a beautiful spot to be, especially here at Ignatius Centre. You'll see a bit of Ignatius Centre at the end when uh, we'll play you a few, we'll show you a few slides of, of this beautiful land that we, we uh, enjoy here. Enjoy is, the, is an operative word for the next 50 minutes or so. Originally, we said we were going to call this webinar, Learn About Animal, Amazing Friendships About Animals and Saints. Learning is good, but enjoyment is much, much better. So we want you to take whatever you need to do to have permission to relax, to enjoy yourself, to look at some pictures, hear some stories, listen to some music, and just really enjoy the next 50 minutes. So animals and saints. Most of us know what animals are. 
They're creatures of a huge variety of shapes and sizes and colors, capabilities and personalities and talents. But what are saints? They might be a little more difficult to, to pin down. I'd say saints are pretty much, pretty much the same thing. Creatures of huge varieties of shapes, sizes, and colors, capabilities, personalities, and talents. Uh, some are poor, some are rich, some are well-educated, some are, are not. Uh, all kinds of various, some are old, some are young, die young, all kinds of shapes and sizes to our saints. But perhaps the one thing that would distinguish a saint from any other person is that they're creatures who live in constant awareness, well, hopefully constant awareness, of their closeness to God. They inhabit a world that is full of God's goodness, and they inhabit it, inhabit it gratefully and consciously. So creatures, uh, animals and saints are both creatures, and they have a lot in common. So it's no accident or no surprise that they would be good friends. And this friendship can teach us a good deal about how we, too, can befriend creation and how we can uh, live gratefully and consciously in God's good creation. Because it seems to me that uh, to, to give reverence to creatures and to creation is to revere uh, the creator. So all these stories, that there are seven different stories in this book, and they all derive from the tradition, from the tradition of the saints. So I didn't make up any of the stories. I've embellished them. I've, I've added a bit of dialogue, a bit of maybe detail here and there, but they all come from the, from the tradition. Whether they exactly have, I, mean, I, was, I wasn't there when, when Isidore and Maria, whom you'll meet momentarily, I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly what happened, but tr tradition tells us these things. And it's wonderful to, to step into this river of tradition and say, okay, we can learn something from these, these wonderful people and these wonderful animals whom they befriended. So, uh, in the 12th century, Spain, near Madrid, lived Isidore and Maria, husband and wife. In fact, both saints, both, both um, recognized by the church as saints. Now they were very poor. They farmers, but they didn't own their own land. They, they were basically peasant farmers and um, had a life of hardship in many ways. But that hardship never diminished their generosity, which just blossoms. And so you're gonna hear a bit of that. Here is a beautiful spread of Carrie's amazing pictures. And you'll see more of those in a second. But I'm gonna read you a nice little story. So make yourself comfortable, Isidore and Maria. Good farmers love to feed people. Great farmers love to feed all life, human and otherwise. Isidore and Maria were truly great farmers. After a hard week's work on the farm, these two saints, husband and wife, spent their weekends, weekends cooking up big pots of soup for those who had no food. They were so generous and the poor were so hungry that they sometimes came to the bottom of the pot with plenty, plenty of people still in line. But these saints didn't worry or try to save the last bit for themselves. Like good farmers, they kept on working reaching their big spoon down, scooping and serving, scooping and serving, all the while saying with wide country smiles, buen provecho, enjoy your meal. And guess what? They never ran out. No matter how long the line, no stomach went away empty. Well, it happened one day that after winter had spread a thick icing of snow across the ground, bushes and trees, Isidore set out on foot to the local mill. He needed to grind a big sack of grain into flour. On his way, he came across a flock of pigeons huddled together in a cold clump. All their normal food lay locked away under the heavy snow. Isidore's great farmer's heart nearly broke. Buen provecho, he whispered, pouring out half his sack across the whiteness. Some passerby, obviously not a farmer, called the saint stupid for wasting his grain on birds. But Isidore didn't think so. It warmed him to watch them eat. After they flew away happy, Isidore shouldered his much lighter burden and carried on. 
But by the time he reached the mill, the sack he had, had regained its original weight. It was full again. Isidore had lost nothing through his generosity. As the millstone went round and round, grinding flour, Isidore kept giving thanks again and again for God's giant love for all creatures. And now Carrie is going to walk you through some of her gorgeous artwork. Thanks, Greg. And hi, everyone. I'm so glad that so many of you could be with us today. Um, there's so much to share about the artwork in this book. And some of it is so complex that I decided that what I would do is put a little video together to walk you through some of the uh, artwork and to answer some of the questions that people always ask me about this artwork. Uh, and just before I begin, I'd like to say a couple of quick thank yous. First of all, I'd like to say thanks to Greg for inviting me into this creative endeavor with him. And a huge thank you to Simon and, Novella, and Novalis for their patience is, as they allowed this creative process uh, to unfold. And a uh, big thanks too to Troy, who put up with many, many edits to, he, he endured so many edits to be able to get the book into the state it's in today. So as I uh, share this little video about the artwork, you may just want to bump up your volume a little bit, uh, just to make sure that uh, you can hear the opening. It's a little softer than, than we are now. Hello, my name is Carrie Wilson. And I'm a mother, spiritual director, educator, music teacher, and I'm the illustrator and resources author for Amazing Friendships Between Animals and Saints. I live in Guelph, Ontario, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about how the art for this book came about. When I was a child, there were certain picture books that my sister and I absolutely loved, and we would read them over and over again marveling at their beautiful, beautiful drawings. My first thought with Amazing Friendships was that I wanted this book to be just like that, treasured and remembered for years to come, a classic. But how to achieve that? As a parent and teacher who has spent hundreds of hours reading with kids, I knew that this book would have to be engaging on many levels. It's hard for younger kids to stay tuned in when there are very few pictures to look at. So my thought was that the borders around the stories needed to be so fun, so interesting, so whimsical and playful that children would be visually engaged for the entire length of the story. The art would need to be so captivating that they would love it so much that they would want to read the book again and again. That was my aim. But why not make it a game too? Everyone loves hide and seek and solving puzzles. So I hit a magpie in every border. Magpies are common to all the different ecosystems I drew, so the first game is find the magpie. As the drawings evolved, more creatures began to populate the drawings, many that I had never encountered before. I was so entertained as I learned about these creatures that I thought, wouldn't it be fun if everyone could enjoy this adventure? An even bigger game of hide and seek. So, at the back of the book, I've provided an alphabetical list of creatures for each saint. Try to find them in each story border. According to folklore, magpies steal things and take them back to their nests. The magpie's nest at the back of Amazing Friendships has one item from each saint in it. Can you figure out which item goes with which saint? Another puzzle to solve. But how do you know if you got it right? There's actually a link on the final page that will take you to the online resources. There you will find all the answers to these hide and seek puzzles. Everything is labeled. You'll notice on this solution, I've also labeled the circles. These hidden repeating circular patterns are in every border, another game. Can you find the circles? But why did I bother to put all those circles in anyway? 
I wanted this book to feel like the time period that the stories came from, very old. I'd been looking at woodcuts and illuminated manuscripts from those centuries, and many had stylized, organic, circular vine patterns, much like this one. I wondered, hmm, could I use that idea in a natural landscape? These drawings became an adventure for me as an artist, and I wondered, could I make this work? Drawn as a spiritual practice, these drawings were gently guided so that I never knew what was coming next. Surprises emerged, and the first pencil drawing with the circular border patterns came into being. Moving forward, I began each drawing with a sketched framework of circles. I would then arrange the creatures in those circles. The next step was color. Many people think these are paintings, but they're not. They're actually blended pencil crayon. Let's look at the evolution of the St. Francis drawing as an example of how one drawing came into being. I always began by researching the ecosystem and tried to show different times of day. This is evening. I also tried to show different seasons and weather. This is winter rain in southern France. I usually would start with the title in a complementary color to the landscape. As the drawings crept over the page, the composition gradually emerged. One image would lead to the next. One of the challenges with blended pencil crayon is that you can't layer white over top of color. So the only part of the drawings that are done with paint are the whiskers, which are white, and the dandelion fluffies. Uh, and you can see how the white brush strokes create the white over the color. I've heard that hundreds of years ago, artists would not sign their work because they believed that it really was not theirs, since their inspiration had come from God. This is exactly how it felt creating these drawings. Often at the end of the day, I would stand back and look at what had emerged and just marvel and wonder where in the world did that come from. So what is the process of drawing with blended pencil crayons? After sketching in the pose, I would layer up the color by choosing a range of pencils, just like this. Working on watercolor paper, I would start with the lightest colors, lay down two or three of them, then I would blend them with a blending marker that has 90% rubbing alcohol in it. The depth and texture results from layering up the colors, blending at each stage, until the desired result is achieved. Since I'm primarily a painter, I kept wanting a painted look, so I would blend and blend until it got there. If you would like to learn how to draw this way, I offer workshops and retreats for children and adults on creativity and spirituality. You can visit my website, carryartist.com, to learn more about this or follow me on Instagram at Carrie Artist to get the latest announcements. My real hope for you is that this book will be treasured for years to come and that the artwork in it will help you and your children develop an even closer relationship with nature and with God. So it's been quite a journey with this book and uh, I've got to say a huge thank you to my family. It took a long time to draw all these pictures and they put up with me through the whole th thing. So thank you to my husband, Paul, my daughters, Rowena and Stephanie. And I have to give a big shout out to my sister, Laura, who's also an artist and who was my troubleshooter along the way. Uh, so thank you very much. All the artwork is for sale. Uh, some of it has already sold, but uh, if you are interested in, in, it, in any of the art, uh, give me a shout at my website, carryartist.com or th uh, through Instagram, carryartist. Over, over to you, Greg. Thank you, Carrie. So what's the point of the book and all these stories contained in it? Two words uh, can describe the whole point as, as I see it. And they're rather large words, so I'll try to, to explain myself. The words are ecological conversion. 
This was a term first used by Pope John Paul II uh, some years ago, but it's been fully embraced by Pope Francis, our current, the current Pope of the Catholic Church. And conversion, for those who've known it or read about it, uh, at least in the Christian tradition, uh, gives those who have been converted strength and purpose, courage and boldness, patience, endurance, understanding. And these are all virtues that are very, very necessary, crucial, in fact, for our current juncture with the earth and this climate of war that we are unfortunately um, waging against nature. So until ecology becomes a very, very personal affair, a very spiritual matter, in fact, our unity with creation will always be kind of partial and you can almost say pharisaical, like the Pharisees in the, in the, in the Gospels, more concerned with appearances and with kind of advantages to ourselves than with hard reality. Uh, some Christians talk about being born again, and they say that Jesus has become their personal Lord and Savior. Uh, that personal relationship with creation is what the book is trying to get at. And this is what the conversion is all about, is, is making our, our connection with creation personal and not just kind of economic or not just um, kind of food-based or anything. It's something that's very, very personal. It's kind of this I-thou relationship, a real friendship between us and creation. And as I mentioned before, if we learn to, to give reverence to creation, we're actually venerating the creator. So each story has something to teach us about this conversion. The story of Isidore and, and Maria teach us uh, what uh, Pope Francis calls the integrity of ecology. Integrity being the unity, the, the, the harmony of ecology. Because uh, as human beings, we're part of creation. And so any kind of division that sets up humans against creation, or says that the economy is pitted against the, the environment, or that uh, we have to uh, think that the poor somehow don't fa factor in our, into our, our ecological concerns. Uh, these are false dichotomies and they're actually very harmful because we're all of a piece, all of creation is a piece. And so there is, there'll be no ecological justice without social justice. There will be no uh, peace on earth unless there's peace amongst peoples. So under, under, underneath all this is uh, our identity, our unity with creation as fellow creatures. Uh, so each story has this moral, this ecological moral, that is accompanied by a quote from Laudato Si, this here book by Pope Francis. Now, you don't have to be a Catholic to appreciate this, and in fact, because it's written for all earthlings, in fact, saying that unless we really take this as a spiritual quest, a spiritual uh, responsibility, we're not really going to um, get very far. And it's not, even if we get very far, it's not really going to mean much to us. Again, the whole point is enjoyment, and joy springs from a deep, deep connection. So uh, this book was uh, written in 2015, so it's five, it's going on six years old now. And I want to include it because it's so, so very important. It's, it's in fact one of the most important documents to have come from the church in the last hundred years, I would say. Let me just uh, read you a little bit, uh, just so you get a, a good sense of what this means. And, and I'm, I'm sure you resonate with it, even if you have not read it yourselves. The external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. This is actually, that was actually a quote from uh, Pope Benedict. For this reason, the ecological crisis is also a summons to profound interior conversion. It must be said that some committed and prayerful Christians, with the excuse of realism or pragmatism, tend to ridicule expressions of concern for the environment. Others are passive, they choose not to change their habits and thus become inconsistent. So what they all need is an ecological conversion. What we all need is an ecological conversion, whereby the effects of their encounter with Jesus Christ become evident in their relationship with the world around them. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So beautiful words that say, really say our vocation here on earth is, is to be uh, caretakers uh, and to, and to sp spread our love and, and do it not only kind of in words, but in deeds. And that's what these, these saints teach us. They teach us not only to say pretty things and to um, tweet pretty 
pretty messages, but actually to befriend and, and sometimes put your life on the line for your friends. So we'll go on to you, Carrie. Thanks, Greg. Well, I'm going to share a little bit um, about the online resources with you. And uh, I've got to say, say a big thank you to Anne Louise, our editor, who helped this book and all these resources come into shape. And uh, just um, these, these resources are available for free and they are on the Novalis website and you can access them. There's a link at the back of the book. So uh, again, I put together a quick video because it is, um, there's just too much to try to <laughs> just talk about it. Here we go. Hello, my name is Carrie Wilson. As an educator, my favorite children's books were always those that were more than just a story. As a family, we would often live for weeks with a book that offered more activities and greater depth, digging into it and exploring. And that's what I really wanted this book to offer. As a teacher, I was aware that any resources that could add to the stories would be really helpful, but they had to be quick and easy to access. So here's a brief overview of the online resources. The link in the back of the book will take you to the Novalis landing page, which is the table of contents essentially. Just click on the item and the hyperlink will take you directly to that page. These resources are free for you to use. Introductory materials appear first. Then each saint has their own section. The introductory materials are, first, Ontario curriculum links. These will help you integrate the stories and lesson plans into units of study based on subject and grade. And thanks very much to Wendy Macri for helping put these together. Next comes the solution to the nest. Everything's labeled. I've also included how to lead contemplative activities. Many of you will never have done this and may think, oh, I could never do that. But it's not as hard as you think. I do this all the time as a spiritual director, as I've worked sharing spiritual practices with children and youth for years. So it is possible. In this document, I've gathered together some insights to try to offer you some support and encouragement in trying this for the first time. It can be very rewarding. But always remember, you are planting seeds and you may not see results immediately. Don't forget that just the exposure to this type of spiritual practice can leave a lasting impression on a child. Now for each saint, there are six or seven more items. Let's look at Isidore and Maria as an example. In the resources, you will find first, a printable can you find list. This could be used at home with an individual child, or it could be handed out to every child in a class. These are formatted to save paper, and they are arranged so that children can check off the creatures as they find them. Second, there is a projectable storyboarder for reading aloud. Often when kids are sitting at the back, they can't see the pictures when a story is being read aloud to the class. This slide has all the pictures from the book in a format that can be projected onto a screen. Every child in the room will be able to see all the detail as the story is being read aloud. It also contains the Can You Find list in the middle so that it can be easily used as a group activity. Third, a projectable solution for the Can You Find list is provided. This image has all the creatures labeled and also shows the circles, if kids had been trying to spot the circles in the artwork. Next, Greg Kennedy has provided some creature and ecosystem facts. These are written in the same playful and lyrical style as the stories, providing information about some of the creatures and ecosystems. The first line is in bold as a standalone fact for younger students. Next comes the lesson plan. 
Based on a theme related to the story, these active and engaging lesson plans provide a wide range of activities, from science experiments, to games, to art, to going out in nature, or engaging in discussions. Educational objectives are clearly defined and discussion prompts are included. Each lesson begins by reading the story and has suggestions for adapting the activity for different age groups. This sample lesson is a role play game that explores the impacts of taking too much from nature. In this game, students take on the roles of humans, animals, etc., all needing to eat from a limited food source. This is represented by beans and goldfish crackers, making it fun. With each round of play, a new element is added, such as cooperation, or sharing, or caring for other creatures, or an awareness of one's own privilege. Extension activities are included as a way to deepen the experience, and it easily could be shared by people of different ages at home or in a church setting. These lesson plans are a springboard into a contemplative activity that can be done easily individually or in a group or classroom setting. Many of these forms of prayer involve movement, which may be a different way of looking at prayer for some people. But for kids, this can be a very important way to engage. For a fuller explanation of this, see the document, How to Lead Contemplative Activities. Opening and closing prayers are provided, along with discussion prompts to debrief the experience. Many of these can be done either outdoors or indoors and are appropriate intergenerationally. Additional materials such as printable handouts or a video of the story being read aloud by the author or musical creations are also provided. One of the unique things about these resources is that they connect old stories from our faith with modern day science activities and with spiritual practices. All are integrated in a seamless flow and the activities are such that they can be done by children or anyone of any age. They would be excellent for family ministry. I really hope that you find these resources useful. If you have any questions about them, please feel free to contact me. My website's on the back of the book. I offer art and spirituality workshops for teachers and students. So if you're interested in hearing about those, the best way to keep up to date is to follow me on Instagram. I don't post very much, but I will post about the book. Okay, so there's a lot available online and we're also going to be adding these videos from today to the online resources so you would be able to access them uh, again in the future. Uh, thanks very much to my daughter Rowena who helped me put those videos together and uh, back to you Greg. Well, thank you. So, so much to learn, so much to uh, give thanks for. Are we going to conclude with the song? Well, let's do that. Uh, eh? Greg, we have the activity as well. Yeah, I thought you were going to do that. Oh, okay. I, I'll do it now then. We'll, I'll, I'll, I'll share or, that right or should we? Do you want to jump to the song? Pardon? Do you want to jump to the song? Uh, I think we have time. The activity is only about three minutes, so we could give it a try. Okay. We would say a, we have a democratic vote, but we can't see your hands, so I'm afraid you get what you get. You get what's coming to you, my friends. <laughs> okay. All right. So there's one little contemplative activity that we wanted to share with you today, and um, it's very short, and uh, it too will be added to the online resources. So here it is. So what we will do today is an abbreviated version of Visio Divina. Uh, you could actually spend a lot more time doing this, but today we're only going to take a few minutes. I created each saint's title page so that it could be used for Visio Divina. 
With these large drawings, I tried to capture the essence of the relationship between the saint and their animal friend in one single image. This image can then be used for Visio Divina, either in a personal reflection or as part of a retreat. So what is Visio Divina? It translates as divine seeing and has been used for centuries as a form of gazing contemplation in which one gazes on an image for a period of time. It is a multi-sensory way of praying. Watch for what catches your attention, then stay with that and reflect on its meaning for you. Here are the steps. First we will center, then gaze for two minutes, ending with Greg's poem, and then take a short time for reflection and response. And then we'll close. So let's center. Close your eyes and breathe deeply, clearing your mind. And take a few deep breaths. Ask God to speak to you through this experience. Now gently open your eyes and gaze on the image. Isidore was pious, not lazy, and while angels steered his oxen, he prayed as if he plowed, with huge fervor, but also freedom, knowing that the work of growth after seeding was much more the earth's than his own. So you can ask yourself, where were you in that picture? Where did you see yourself? In the birds, in Isidore, feeding the birds, in the grain being offered, perhaps all three. So many things can be done with the, 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 the art, many things can be done with the stories themselves. What I've done, um, and in the process of, of my, my rather uh, fledgling musical career, um, writing music for, for these states. I've, I've written three now. I, um, what you'll hear is, is the one for Isidore and Maria. They have many, there's so many stories uh, that I couldn't fit into these, these wonderful, these, these little short stories in, in the book uh, because the saints themselves were people, of course. So they had this whole lifetime of experiences. And the more we get to know them, the deeper our, our friendship with them grows. So in the poem that you just heard, it said um, something about the angels steered the oxen. So one of the stories is that there was a lot of envy, I guess, in Spain at that time. So there's all kinds of envy thrown at um, both Maria and Isidore. And he would sneak off to, to pray in, in the chapel in the morning. And so the people that didn't like him told the boss what he was doing. And the boss got upset and so went to spy on Isidore. And what he saw was angels uh, plowing the fields while he was off praying. And so the work was getting done, but um, Isidore was not kind of hell-bent on, on getting it all done himself. He, he wasn't a workaholic, you could say. They lived by this old well, and this well features into many of their stories. They had, uh, they had a child that whom died, but before the ch poor child died of a preventable disease, um, the child fell into the well, they prayed, and, and the well kind of welled up and the water welled up and brought the child to safety. In many of these stories with the saints, certain, there's certain discrepancies. So some of the stories say, well, a chicken fell down the well and the same thing happened. So there's a wonderful kind of charming little anecdotes. Uh, but I'll just say that these saints, uh, generous, hardworking, and um, they knew pain. They knew pain. They, never, they didn't have their own land. This child who died uh, was a, a huge loss for them. 
So I want to just leave you finally with uh, this little song I wrote. And what you'll see uh, are scenes from Ignatius Jesuit Center, which is dear to both Carrie and my hearts and Joe has been there too. So all three of us know this place uh, rather intimately. And we hope that you can come out here too sometime with our retreats, which is walking the land, our old growth forest project, our community shared agriculture is a 600 acre certified organic farm. So many good things are happening here. So I'll just play this little video. Hopefully it, um, you'll, you'll um, pardon my singing and we'll, then we'll go on to questions. So it's been wonderful to be with you. Uh, thank you for coming. And we look forward to more uh, friendships in the future. They toiled where Chiodi dreamed In Madrid's short, hot shadow They were never what they seemed To eyes with envy narrow Faithful to a God who seldom spares the faithful, they lost their only child, yet by grace they remained grateful. The poor you will always have, cause the rich like it lonely. Land that they never had, love them for their story. They lived by a deep old well that gave them all they prayed for, whatever in it fell was with fresh laughter restored but it couldn't save their child who like all impoverished ill innocently died from a sickness that should not kill the poor you will always have cause the rich like it lonely of you, Carrie Lynn and Greg. That was a great way to bring the presentation to a close. Uh, love the photographs, many great memories in that. Um, we do have a few minutes before we close out this uh, webinar for some questions and I, I've been monitoring the, the questions and I've got a few uh, for you guys, for both of you. Um, First, very obvious one, but where did this idea for this book come from? And uh, whoever feels uh, they want to jump in. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I was in Colombia for a couple of years working with a, an NGO and a Jesuit NGO down there uh, that did agricultural renewal, you could say, organic agriculture, teaching it to the, the local peasants. And I, it, this 
the NGO was situated in a, a Jesuit high school. And so I had this notion of having some of the kids uh, draw cartoons about these, these friendships between animals and saints in order to, for them to learn the ecological lessons from them. It didn't happen. Uh, I, I had to leave after four months. And uh, so this was kind of still rattling around in my brain. And then uh, Carrie, uh, um, Marilyn Gillespie, a uh, friend of Carrie and mine, uh, introduced each other. I was looking for a guitar teacher. Carrie became my guitar teacher. And anyway, we started this and I asked Carrie if she would be interested in, in drawing it. And she was. And that's how it kind of all, it took, it, it took two years, I think. Was it, Carrie, about two years in, in the making? Do you want to say anything? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was, uh, um, yeah, it was two years and a little bit more. <laughs> it's been great. Yeah. It's been a great collaboration, you know, and uh, it's, it's been uh, a discovery. Like, we didn't really know exactly how it was going to unfold, so it was an adventure. Indeed. Can I, uh, we do have a question here from Donna Little, and that is, how did you choose which saints, in, in fact, to include in this book? That was difficult. We were somewhat constrained by space. We could have, I could have added another seven in them, but uh, space was some, something of an issue. I, in fact, at first, I didn't want St. Francis in there because everyone knows St. Francis, but then um, Novalis wisely said, no, no, we should have St. Francis in there. So St. Francis made his, his appearance. But we, we could easily make another book of other saints. There are so many of them. And so uh, the other saints, uh, saints with dogs, saints with um, vegetarian saints, which I am kind of interested in, a long time vegetarian myself. Uh, just so many, just so many beautiful people uh, with beautiful animals. And I guess, and partly I address this in the book that uh, it's important that we, we kind of expand our friendships just beyond the domesticated animals. Of course, our, fr our friends and cats and dogs and, and goldfish, which are wonderful. Uh, but I mean, especially now, can we befriend chickens and cows and pigs, um, animals that suffer greatly at times from our industrial style of agriculture? So how do we embrace them as friends? And, and if, if they are our friends, this will require that we, we actually treat them thus. Thank you, thank you. I do have a question for Carrie, Carrie Lynn. Have you always had this uh, predilection to do art uh, around nature, you know, animals and, and uh, their environments or how did you come to that? I'm actually an abstract artist. <laughs> so this was my first venture into anything like this. In my university training, of course, I did all the life drawing that you have to do. But, um, so this was what you see in the book. It's my first time drawing water. It's my first time drawing a chicken. It's my first time drawing all these various things. So it was a real adventure. It, uh, I, I really needed uh, God's support and guidance throughout the whole thing because uh, I wasn't sure I could do it, but it's fun. Uh, I, I love the concept of the surround the surrounding art around the text itself. It really does uh, uh, create a whole out of it. It's, it's really quite nice. Uh, we do have another question though for Roger uh, D'Souza. He asks, "Do you have a favorite saint? Uh, either one of you?" Well, that's a difficult one. There's so many different saints. Um... I'm kind of partial to Maria and Isidore, partly because they're a, a good team, partly because I've always wanted to be a farmer myself, and in fact, uh, do a bit of farming here at Ignatius. So they are, uh, and also, I mean, they, they just seem very, their ability to, to wed the ecological and the social seemed to be uh, so essential for us. But I could, I could name many others. Um, St. Martin de Porres is another uh, beautiful, beautiful saint whom you can meet in the, in the book. Gary? Yeah, I would say that Bridget is definitely my favorite because when I went to draw her, so I did all the borders first and then I went back and I did the title pages and in my drawing process, I, I said I, I drew it as a spiritual practice. So what that meant for me is that I didn't always decide what the drawing was going to be and so I would prayerfully wait for the drawing to emerge and when Bridget arrived, 
she arrived full blown, like in my head and in my vision and just landed on the page with incredible presence and power. And it was like somebody had actually come and visited me. <laughs> so uh, she's my favorite. Okay, great. We actually have a suggestion here. We've got a, a number of people in our, in our chat and our Q&A who suggest there could be an amazing friendships uh, 2.0. Um, but uh, one suggestion is that we do one focusing on saints and urban animals such as pigeons, raccoons, rodents, urban hawks. Uh, it's interesting during this pandemic, I think we're in a kind of space where we may have been paying much more attention to those kinds of things. Is that something that would uh, be of interest? Well, curiously enough, they, I just read in the Toronto Star today that ra incidents with raccoons have, have kind of gone up 60% since, since last year because there are so many people are at home, as you say, Joe. And uh, kind of well, say, well, what a cute thing up there. They go out there and get scratched. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, so be, be wise, be wise with you in your, in your friends. Uh, so uh, some of them aren't so cuddly as, as we might want them to be. Uh, well, Martin de Porres was a, a great example. He was a city dweller. And he, but apparently around him, uh, mice, cats and dogs would all eat out of the same dish. So that he had this, this way of bringing, harmonizing all these uh, seemingly enemies. So uh, who knows? Yeah, maybe maybe there's there's uh, something there. But I like the suggestion because so often we in the ecological world tend to only focus on pristine nature, on nature away from uh, humans, where, whereas worldwide the pop uh, urbanized population is, is greater than a rural population. So we have to look at how do we interact with creation? Uh, how, do, how do we be friends to our in, in our urban settings and then again that also involves uh, knowing how the way we live in our urban settings impacts the rest of the world uh, that's not urbanized. Carrie, you want to say anything? Um, so the way I moved and worked through the artwork as you can hear it was a very organic process um, <clears throat> with this book coming into being, actually reaching the point of actually being something, you know, that I can pick up in my hand and actually hold, uh, it feels like having just given birth. And I feel like I need to sit and hold the baby for a while before I think about the next one. So, <laughs> so who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, one little question here for Carrie, and that is, did you have any kind of images of these saints before you uh, actually started to try to conceive of what they would look like? No, I had no images at all. And they um, very much like Bridget arrived. Um, all of them arrived. And it, it uh, same thing with the animals. I, I, I started with the borders, which don't have any people in them. They're all just creatures. And all of the animals had a, a presence and a sense about them uh, that they would actually arrive to me and they would come to me and then I would draw them. And sometimes I think this is why the, it took so long to do this because I, I would wait for them to come before I would draw them. So no, I didn't, <laughs> didn't have any saints in my mind. Okay. Thank you. One point, uh, one of our, our attendees has, has suggested, is there, is there anything about the Jesus himself that would, uh, uh, lead to an appearance in a, a future book. Of course, Jesus, um, he loved the birds of the air. Uh, he, he talked about the lilies of the field. I think he was, a, I mean, I think Jesus was a great observer and lover of, of creation. I mean, how could he not be being somehow part of, part of the creator himself, himself, in, as the Trinity tells us. So, um, yeah, uh, who, there may even be books about that already. I'm not quite sure. So, but if not, maybe they need to be written. And... Okay. Well, listen, it's it's uh, very close to our hour. Uh, we've had a great afternoon. Uh, is there any final thoughts from either of you before we uh, we close up uh, our webinar for this afternoon? No, just a hearty thanks once again for being with us. Uh, uh, hope you enjoy the book. Hope you uh, uh, can maybe even become converted, as it were. Uh, at least pray for conversion. Uh, pray for all the world's conversion to, to
to a, just a, a healthier and uh, friendlier relationship with, with this world that, that uh, we need and it needs us. So, so thank you. And same thing from me. Thank you to everybody. I have um, all, all my adult life, I've uh, participated in environmental activism. And this is my latest form of environmental activism. Hopefully, it will be loved by children all, all over. And it'll bring them into closer relationship with nature and uh, our creator. And that love will foster more care and better, better relations overall with the world and each other. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, uh, Greg, uh, for sharing with us this afternoon. The fascinating process that went into this book, the inspiration, the music, the art. It really has been a, a wonderful afternoon and I'm getting lots of chat here from different people who are passing on their thanks. Congratulations. Uh, people are saying it was very inspiring. So, um, it's been, it's been a wonderful afternoon. I want to thank all of you out there who have joined us this afternoon as well. Finally, I also want to remind you, and I'm, I'll share my screen here um, on this. Just so, uh, just so you know, uh, don't forget, you can still get 20% 20, 20 off your own copy of the book. Uh, you'll see here on the screen, uh, if you go to novalis.ca, just uh, the book appears right on the home page so you just click on that it'll take you right to the page and when you check out you can use this code uh, WBAF20 and you'll get your 20% discount so keep that in mind that's it for this afternoon again once again thank you everyone uh, stay safe and have a great evening take care